Okay. My recording got interrupted by a <clears throat> by an alarm. Unfortunate. But so this is part two of um, accepting the hazards of relationship. Sometimes uh, the others the other gives you stability. Sometimes the other takes it away. Depending on the situation, stabilizing and destabilizing aspects can be developmental. Too much stability could mean stagnation. Too much instability can demoralize you and break down your will to go on. So this last statement before the alarm went off um, might not have gotten recorded. It's like if you're not willing to accept hazards, don't have romances or close friendships. Maybe a stuffed animal would work. And yet the greatest tragedy in many lives of this era, despite all the hazards, is the lack of relationships. A far greater hazard. We are social animals and we need relationships. Relationships are the primary source of meaning in most lives. Um, you know, if, you, if, you, if a person's not available, a dog or a cat um, can still be a soulful, loving relationship. In 2024, as I revised this card, one of the great social ills visible everywhere and in many grim statistics is that quality relationships are severely declining. Younger generations report fewer close friends, lovers, and even acquaintances. Smartphones and social media have caused a sharp decline in the social skills needed to form relationships. This decline in social bonds creates profound hazards for individuals and society. A key thing to look for in prospective lovers, allies, and friends is level of commitment to consciousness. There could be weird asymmetries in money, age, um, looks, all kinds of different things. It could still work out if, if, if this area is compatible. The present levels of consciousness could be quite different, in which case the more evolved person um, can act as a mentor. Um, but maybe the other person will catch up and overtake them. But a compatible level of commitment is, it, to consciousness is the most crucial variable, in my opinion, to look for. Much depends on the willingness of the other to work through hazards in a life-affirming way, and that is often a direct function of their commitment to consciousness. In my experience, this commitment is an essential, innate, and irreducible factor we cannot supply for the other. So um, try and gauge that up front. Remember, somebody could be highly intelligent and talented, not to mention good looking and other things, and not have that commitment to consciousness. It is not the same as intelligence. Another irreducible factor is where someone is on the benevolence to malevolence spectrum. Everyone has a shadow. And it's unwise to commit yourself to a relationship if you cannot recognize and work with the other's shadow. Even if you don't see the other's shadow, you are in a state of hazardous ideal. If you don't see the other's shadow, you're in a state of hazardous idealization. If the relationship continues, you will inevitably confront their shadow, and the idealization will likely crash into hazardous states, hazardous states of disillusion and disenchantment. So um, where somebody is in malevolence to benevolence, that's something, a variable that overlaps with commitment to consciousness because the more committed to consciousness, the likely more ethical someone will be. But um, that spectrum might be even more important. Like my dog is, probably doesn't have a high commitment to consciousness, but it's very benevolent. And so it's a loving relationship that, prevents, um, it doesn't have many instabilities, they don't talk back, they don't get neurotic, um, and uh, it's a very secure, loving relationship, um, and so that can still be extremely valuable. Accepting the hazards of relationships does not mean that we needlessly multiply them. There are many sorts of preventable hazards that arise um, <clears throat> um, that are, arise because of, left out some words here, 
because of carelessness, neglect, or ignorance. We can lessen many relationship hazards by being more discerning about who we choose to enter a relationship with. Many hazards can be avoided uh, by openness about expectations, agreements, promises, and boundaries at the onset. Like I've um, been advising quite a few people who um, will have some big relationship conflicts because they were not clear or did not skillfully negotiate or understand at the beginning that one person was more into polyamory and one person was more into monogamy. And I've seen it with some uh, millennials and Gen Zs where they believe in an ideology of polyamory and advocate for it as though it were superior to monogamy, which is just as foolish, in my opinion, as advocating for monogamy as superior to polyamory. Um, <clears throat> we've got a, a Dungeons and Dragons session about to begin at the house. Uh, my godson, Indigo, is a dungeon master, so there's going to be a lot more noise for while well, I finish this up. I was They warned me about that, though. Anyway, it's not a recording studio. Any, but that's a hazard of relationship that's well worth it. So... Um, <clears throat> Polyamory versus monogamy, I believe, is an irreducible need. Uh, it relates to someone's irreducible eros, just like gay and straight. You should not advocate that gay people be straight or that straight people be bisexual or whatever. These are innate differences. You can make, you can make a case why one is better than the other because each one has its own advantages, but that is not a, a choice Um there might be some rare exception somewhere, but for the most part, it's not. And therefore, um, it's a you're doing spiritual violence to someone to um, try and sway them from what, what they need. Some people need monogamy. Some people need polyamory. Polyamory advocates will say, oh, you're trying to, monogamy is bad. You're trying to own someone. It's patriarchal. Okay, you know what else is, can be patriarchal and owning somebody? Harems. Those are patriarchal. Um, you can find horrible um, examples of monogamy or polyamory. Each one can be done well or terribly, um, but one, one must recognize one's need and um, be true to that. Otherwise, you have to work out some extremely clever compromise, and that should be worked out at the onset if those aren't perfectly compatible between parties. So... Um, if it's a business deal, if it's a romantic relationship, the more you can be clear about expectations, agreements, promises, and boundaries at the outset, the less likely conflict later on. No single oracle card can cover all the potential hazards and ways to deal with them of relationships, but there are two great principles to keep in mind. Following these two great principles will eliminate almost all needless hazards in relationships. Notice I said needless. Some are needed. It's easier said than done, though. I don't flawlessly follow these principles myself, but I really work toward following them. I had a breakthrough related to, the, to these principles just a couple of days ago. Often that work requires moment-to-moment -moment vigilance, almost always in relationships, even in a conversation, moment-to-moment -moment vigilance. So I'm going to just give you a quick sentence or two in these principles, but then there are cards to look up, also videos, um, to get more in-depth treatment. The first principle is inner independence. Inner independence means your center of gravity is the inner wholeness of yourself. If your center of gravity is in the other person, you have an inherently unstable structure that will be a hazard-making machine. Um, okay, so then look up that card. It's linked in the card. For more on the centrality of your relationship to self, um, now, well, there are, I'll let you look in the card for the links. If romantic, okay, meeting halfway, second principle. Meeting halfway is the touchstone of relationships. You want, don't want to meet others less than halfway. Like, you know, if you're at a party and you're too shy to go up to somebody you're interested in, that's meeting less than halfway. If you go up and immediately without any encouragement start hitting on them, that's meeting way more than halfway. Um, if you're giving, um, if somebody close to you asks for advice and you neglect, don't find time to give it to them, meeting less than halfway. Giving unasked for advice, meeting more than halfway. Um, 
So um, be careful about doing too much, compromising your dignity by pushing forward where unwelcome, giving unasked for advice, and so forth. The halfway point may shift moment by moment. A key skill in relating to others is to be, as Carol Anthony puts it approximately, attuned to the subtle minutia of openings and closings in the other person, ready to advance or retreat at a moment's notice, like in the course of a conversation. You know, I've, I've, because my tendency can be dangerous. One is to be like the way I am within myself, like very psychoanalytic, trying to give insights and so forth. Sometimes people are receptive to it, but the moment I sense that they're not, it's time for me to back off and retreat. Later, on the day I revised this card in 2024, I recognized that most of my relationship hazards are caused by my inner adolescent self, which I have even at age 66. Um, but this is how, what we all have. We all have, you know, we're like a tree where, the, you know, you have the, the rings of the previous years of the tree's life are still there and the living sap of life is still running through all of them at least metaphorically i think tree anatomy works a little differently but whatever um but for us it definitely works that way and um my inner adolescent self is often needy vulnerable and attention seeking he's addicted to the high highs and low lows of creating emotional narratives about significant others and if i fail to contain those tendencies he'll set up dramas with others my goal is to not kill off my inner adolescent, who is also a muse, spurring my creativity, sense of adventure, and humor, but to encourage him to keep developing. I brought him forward in my imagination two days ago, and we worked out a more ethical and functional set of compromises. I encouraged him to recognize his tendencies, and he agreed that they make him miserable. He also agreed that when we focus on our life mission rather than our getting caught in dramas, we create fewer hazards in relationships. Our friends like us better and life feels like more of an adventure. And um, it's held up at least for two days um, you know, because I think we actually finally reached a good compromise and understanding. Consider this an auspicious time to accept the hazards of relationships while moving away from creating needless relationship hazards. 